Good morning, my name is Adriano Aguzzi and uh, I am a professor of neuropathology at the University of Zurich and uh, my focus of research uh, since more than two decades uh, has been prion diseases. And uh, today I want uh, to report about uh, the latest uh, research of our laboratory and specifically the results uh, that have been published in the latest issue of Nature. And uh, so our um, concept uh, of uh, what we really want to understand the prion diseases is the following. We understand that um, there is a normal protein of the body which is called PRPC and this protein can transform itself into a misfolded variant uh, that we call PRP star or PRP scrapie and this misfolded variant uh, is actually what drives the uh, toxicity in prion diseases. Uh, now, Although these parts of the process are relatively well understood, we still have a very little idea of what goes on between the formation of PRP scrapie and the actual neurotoxicity. And that is really what we are trying to understand. So how do prions damage the brain? And what I want to discuss with you today is the hypothesis that we have formulated a couple of years ago and that we have been trying to address with the present work. And the hypothesis is that pathological prions infectious prions may share pathways together with the normal physiology of the prion protein and the concept that we have is the following the normal prion protein is attached to the membrane with a glycolipid anchor it contains a globular domain as well as an unfolded uh, um, unstructured flexible tail um, in, uh, under normal conditions, uh, we believe that the flexible tail is important to transmit uh, a neurotrophic signal. However, uh, the hypothesis is that when the pathological prion protein uh, interacts uh, with the normal prion protein, that is when PRP scrape comes in contact with PRPC on the cell uh, surface, uh, that then the, um, uh, the amino terminal tail will misfold and transmit a neurotoxic signal which will eventually damage uh, the neuron. Uh, so in order to address this uh, we have generated a series uh, of mimetic antibodies antibodies that will uh, exert a similar effect as the infection with prions. And what we have found is that, this, that some of these antibodies uh, which will uh, recognize a specific uh, portion um, of the prion protein uh, around uh, um, in the globular domain will trigger toxicity similarly to prion infection. And I want to present one such antibody which is called POM1 and this is the molecular model that indicates how POM1 works. So this is the prion protein and this is a FAB1 fragment of the POM1 antibody. So you can see here the heavy chain and the light chain, they are colored in two different colors. So and this is just the FAB1 fragment, it's not the whole antibody. The whole antibody would be much larger and what you can see is here the contact surface between the prion protein and the POM1 antibody. The contact surface is around 580 square angstroms and indeed this is the model of the prion protein together with the antibody glued together. So you can see there is a relatively small surface that is attached. However, when this attachment occurs then neurodegeneration occurs very rapidly and that is what you can see here. Um, here we have subjected a brain slice. This is a cerebellar cultured slice, an organotypically cultured slice, we have subjected to the antibody and what you can see here is the thickness of the normal slice attached to, to a membrane and however up, upon uh, um, upon delivery of the antibody you can see that the cerebellar granule neurons, so these are the nerve cells in the cerebellum, are, co are completely disappeared, they have been destroyed by the, by, by the antibody and also the slice thickness has been reduced by more than half. So these antibodies are very toxic. What we then have found, in the, um, um, and this was really what made the story very exciting, first of all toxicity does not require 
their bivalency. That is, uh, we can use uh, bivalent version of the antibodies like FAB2 fragments, but we can also use FAB1 fragments, such as this one. We can even use single chain FV fragments, which has very small recombinant versions of the antibodies, and these are also very highly toxic. What you can see here is the thickness of the slice uh, um, without antibody, and you can see that it is completely destroyed uh, by um, the action of the antibody. The other things that we have found that was um, that really got us going was the realization that um, if we make a variant of the prion protein that lacks a part of the amino terminus, and this is what is shown here, this is the, uh, the normal prion protein attached to the, uh, to the cell membrane, and it contains the globular domain, this is the attachment side, the interface to the antibody, this would be the FAB1 of the POM1 antibody, the crystal structure, and this is the amino terminus, which is um, un unstructured and flexible. Now, if you make a variant that, l that lacks this uh, region, what we see is that we can no longer transmit toxicity. The POM1 antibody will still bind, but uh, the toxicity is now completely abolished. This indicates uh, that we are dealing with an allosteric effect. Uh, that is, uh, there is a binding site uh, for the antibody and there is an effector site. Uh, this is where uh, the, the binding uh, induces a conformational transition, an allosteric transition in the, in the amino terminus, and the amino terminus uh, is what drives the toxicity. Now, if that were true, then you would expect that, that blocking the amino terminus with another antibody directed now against these epitopes uh, should be able to prevent the toxicity of POM1. And this experiment was done, and uh, this is exactly what happened. If you block the amino terminus uh, with uh, POM2, which is an antibody against uh, uh, the amino terminus, now POM1 will still bind, but it will no longer be toxic. And uh, then we have generated uh, single-chain versions of also of POM2, and we have found the same, that even the single-chain uh, version of the POM2 of the amino terminal antibody will prevent the toxicity of the single-chain version of the POM1 antibody, which is very important to, um, to prove uh, the specificity of the phenomenon that uh, we have found. So the bottom line, and this is really the model of how we think uh, the toxicity works, uh, is that uh, the, uh, in, in the status quo, in the normal situation, we have the N-terminus uh, that is uh, somewhere uh, um, unstructured, and um, in the presence of the antibody, something happens, a conformational transition, which will uh, uh, cause the N-terminus to get closer to the membrane, and we believe, we don't know exactly what happens there, but what we think is that maybe the N-terminus will even acquire transmembrane conformation, and we, this will create a chain of events which will eventually result in neurotoxicity.